Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we pray now as we have come together that we can hear your voice. We need to understand more clearly day by day that we're not trying to do something to get you to save us. You've already done the hard part. May we see it's ours to cooperate with you. Bless us as it becomes the reality of our life. Help us to understand that everything we read has to fit into that one idea. Jesus is the Savior. And we thank you for protecting us now in his holy name. Amen. A very familiar scripture, Galatians 2.20. Now, we are talking about very familiar things here, as of late, you'll notice. We're talking about practical Christianity, the real thing. And so we can use all the scriptures we're familiar with, but we have to see them a little bit more closely now. You can probably quote this. We're only going to look at part of it. In the King James Version, it says, I am crucified with Christ. Okay? Galatians 2.20. <laughs> Actually, that's all we have to read, because that's all we're going to talk about in that verse. <laughs> I am crucified with Christ. That's King James language. The way we would say it today, the way it was written, is, I have been crucified with Christ. Okay. So that's different. To say, I am crucified with Christ, kind of makes it, well, if I think about it that way, or if, you know, I put it together in a certain way, that's the way it comes out. But no, the real language says, I have been. And there's no messing with that. The scripture says, I have been. <laughs> so that's what we're going to try to understand today. Why does the Bible tell us that? I have been crucified with Christ. Now, Paul can say that. He's a Christian. There's, there's no question in his mind that he's a Christian. He knows why. Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse 14, he says something else there. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Okay? So he's talking about the crucifixion. He says, I have been crucified. And he said, how? On the cross. Now, he didn't say Jesus was crucified. He said, I have been crucified. That's kind of interesting language. We won't look at that too carefully, but he says, I'm crucified to the world. I have no room for it. <laughs> None at all. And he says, and the world doesn't have any room for me either. <laughs> so it's a two-way thing. <laughs> they don't like each other. <laughs> That's another subject. So what we're dealing with here is something that people say all the time. People use a little phrase to say, get a life. <laughs> you know? Hear that all the time. I, don't, I wonder why people go around saying that. Get a life. <laughs> well, actually, that's the solution that Paul is giving us here. He's saying, get a new life. <laughs> The one you have is no good. <laughs> Get a new life. <laughs> and so that's what Christianity is about here, a new life. We must understand that Christianity has something to do with getting rid of the evil nature, selfishness, the fleshly, earthly self. And Paul says here, it's through the cross. Through the cross. Let's notice something here about what Jesus did. 
First of all, Jesus on the cross, he died for sin. The key word here is for, for. He died for me. He died for you, okay? He died for. That's the first thing we want to notice here. It was a perfect sacrifice. And what he did by dying for is something that no one else can ever do. He's the only one who could die for. Okay. And it was perfect what he did. Now, because of how he did it, there is a power that is nowhere else, only there. And the thought that we want to pick up today is, what was it that made the power in what he did at the cross? It was not merely dying. That's just a physical, external act. Everybody can do that. So it was not the dying that was the power. It was the spirit in which he died that was the power. Okay? We want to understand that. The spirit, the way he died. In his mind, in his heart, in his spirit. The spirit by which he died. That leads us to the second part. He died for sin and the second part is he died by that spirit that he had unto sin. See? So he died two things there. He died for me, which he alone could do and no one else could ever do. But, and he also died unto sin. Let's look at uh, Mark 14, <coughs> excuse me, 36. Oops, wait a minute. Mark 14. Let's see. I get my right place here. <coughs> yeah, Mark 14, 36. This is at Gethsemane. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. <laughs> now that's Jesus praying. There must have been something really awful that he knew was coming. He said, take it away. And then he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but your will be done. So he never took himself out of the will, but he just let us know here, there's something really horrible going on here, so take it away. <laughs> but he said, not my will, but your will. And when he said that, he's telling us, I would rather die than sin. Okay. That's the spirit. That's what we want to understand. That's what took him to the cross. It was that spirit in him, I'd rather die than sin. So there's something very powerful here that we need to, to pay attention to. Christ died for me we can all say that he died for me, and in that he stands alone. But that spirit by which he died is what I must have. Okay, are you with me here? I must die to sin. I must rather want to die than to sin. That was his spirit. And our scripture today is telling us 
Yes, Jesus died for me. But when he died unto sin, he wants to take me into fellowship with him that I also may die unto sin. Hmm? I have been crucified with Christ and am now dead to sin. This is what it means to be like Jesus. It doesn't mean go around and be touching people and healing people and all of that. It means to have his spirit. Have the same attitude about things that he had. Believe the same things he believed. To be like Jesus means a lot more than going around not doing certain things. <laughs> Dead with Christ. Well, let's look at that for a minute. Jesus came from eternity. He came here to lay down his life. Okay? He came here to lay down his life. He chose death. Now, please understand what we're saying here. Everything that Jesus did, we are to do through the same power that he did it. He came here and he chose death. He chose it before he came. He knew that's what he was coming for, was to die. Now, we know these things, but please plug it into what we're dealing with here. His spirit. That's his spirit. When we receive Jesus, we receive what? <laughs> that same spirit. So we are not talking theology here. We're not talking about nice Seventh-day Adventist ideas. We're talking about the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, the only plan of salvation that there is. Now, Jesus, after he'd been here on this earth, received a new life. How did he get that new life? It was through death. Okay. His resurrection came after he died. <laughs> His new life came through death. He had victory over sin. Through death. It couldn't touch him anymore. The power of redemption was his. Through death. And he received everlasting glory and exaltation through death. So we see that the mark that's on Jesus, according to the word of God, is his death in that spirit. Okay? He chose to die. In Revelation, when we went through the book of Revelation, you'll notice that in heaven, right now, they're singing a song. Worthy is the Lamb. They, they love to sing it. Worthy is the Lamb. Revelation 5, 9, in case you don't remember where that is. So, worthy is the Lamb. He was... Flame. There it is. They sing it. He's worthy. He died. So in heaven, it's the same thing. The mark on Christ is that he came, he chose to die. Now we are talking about God, aren't we? We're not talking about a sinner who has to do this. The sinless pure one. He chose to die. Do you think it's strange that God asks us to enter into his spirit? That spirit that chooses to die. 
See, we don't think about death that way. We think, well, God says I have to die daily, so I'm going to force myself. I'm going to grit my teeth. I'm going to do this and that. That's not what he's asking at all. Jesus never gritted his teeth. <laughs> okay? Nobody had to convince him. Nobody had to drag him through a door. We are to enter into his spirit, into his nature. This is one of the reasons that I don't like to let it go when people are talking about Jesus' nature in a very incorrect way. If we misunderstand his nature, we're not going to understand what he's asking us to do. Let's go over to Romans, the sixth chapter, another very familiar place. And let's see if we can understand a little bit more about what Paul is trying to tell us here. Romans, the sixth chapter. Verse eight. We must learn this. Paul is telling us this is what we're supposed to know before we're baptized. And we certainly should understand this at baptism. <laughs> okay? Not later, not 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years later, but when we're baptized. We should know this is what we're getting into. In verse 8, now, he says, if we be dead with Christ, and he's already said we are, so he's just saying it again. We are dead with Christ. We're not going to get dead. It says we are dead. We must learn it. We are dead with Christ. Verse 11. Reckon yourselves to be dead to sin. Now, are we doing that? Do we live every day reckoning that we are dead to sin? That's a command from God through Paul. Or are we wondering what happened if I sinned five minutes ago? Am I lost? Am I out of the kingdom now? He said, reckon yourself. And he didn't say for ten minutes. He said, for your Christian life. Every minute of your Christian life, reckon yourself to be dead unto sin. And so we say, well, what's going on here? <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> and we need to know. Because most of the people in Christianity today have no idea that Paul even said this. Much less understand what it means. We need to understand, because if we don't understand, we can't have it. God does not give us things just to be handing them out. We're supposed to know what we're doing. We ask him, he reveals it. Okay? Now let's go to the theme that gets people into trouble. Let's talk about Adam. Because if we understand this correctly, and there's no reason not to, we will see what salvation really is. What about Adam? What did he do? Well, we know he sinned, but what did that mean? What had happened when he sinned? He disconnected himself from God, didn't he? That's what sin is. It's a disconnection from God. He died to God. I don't know how many books I've read by scholars who say that in the Hebrew, dying thou shalt die, mean that someday he's going to die. No, he died the moment he sinned. He died to God. He disconnected himself. He was dead spiritually. And of course, what could he hand on to us? Yeah. The only thing he would hand to us is death. 
the same problem he had. I don't know how people come up with the idea that we're born innocent. Adam has nothing to do with us. I really don't understand how people get there. I have not seen one scripture in all the Bible that says that, let alone the spirit of prophecy. So Adam took us into his life. In him, I died to God. I was born dead to God. So I was just like fallen Adam. It came to me through inheritance. I inherited his fallen nature. Nothing I could do about it. That's what I inherited. I was dead in sin. Now, let's look at the second Adam. For some reason, people's minds turn off and they go something wandering off someplace. Now, let's not do that. Let's stay right with the Bible, just the way Paul is talking. The second Adam. I was born into his life when I received Jesus. Not before. Not one second before. The second Adam, when I received Jesus Christ. When I receive Jesus, I receive his death and his life. I receive everything about Jesus. I received that life that died, and I received that life that was resurrected. Let's finish Romans 6.11 now. Reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. Oh, there's two parts to that. Dead to sin, alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So, Jesus rose again. That means I have risen again. I am alive unto God because of union with Christ. And with this, as much as, as we've looked at so far, we can make the statement that a Christian is utterly dead to sin with Christ. Do Christians know this? You know, I've been doing this particular kind of ministry for about 20 years now. And I know that I didn't know it before I received it. <laughs> okay? I was a minister for 15 years in the Adventist church and didn't know any of this. I believed in something called righteousness by faith, which is not the gospel according to the Bible, the way it's being taught today. But the question is, do Christians know this? Romans 6, 3. No, you're not. See, he's asking the question. Christians, do you know this? No, ye not. That so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into what? His death. Well, that's pretty plain, isn't it? <laughs> if we knew what we were doing when we were baptized, we were baptized into his death. So a Christian is utterly dead to sin. Verse 2. Well, then after we're Christians, shall we continue to, to live in sin? What does he say? God forbid. How shall we that are, what? Dead to sin. That's what it says. <laughs> he says, how is it possible that a person who has died with Christ is not dead to sin? That's what he's saying. <laughs> This is an utter impossibility in God's universe. 
to be dead with Christ and not be dead to sin. Now, please don't ask me right now, well, how does it work and how come this and how come that? Just believe what God says. That's all we're doing so far. This is what God says. It doesn't matter what you or I think about it. <laughs> this is the truth. I think one of the problems here is that God's word cannot be practiced if a person doesn't know what God said. The first thing is we have to know, did he really say this? <laughs> yes, he did. Now from there, we have to move the next step. Well, now, do I believe it? <laughs> oh. Do I believe this? That's pretty rough stuff here. <laughs> Do I believe this? In Christ, I am dead to sin. That's the word of God. Do I believe in the new nature? Well, this is describing the new nature. A raised again life. Now, people who are not insane act out the idea they have about who they are. That's a law of life. People act in accordance with their idea of who they are. Now, when I go to sit in Dick's chair and he brings out that drill, <laughs> I don't think about the drill, I think about Dick. He believes he's a dentist. And I believe it too. <laughs> and he acts like a dentist. He gives me those shots in there. <laughs> and when he's all done, then he works the drill. When he's done, uh, he's, he's saved me. <laughs> I've got a good tooth again. Now, I have a certain credibility with Dick because he acts like a dentist. <laughs> That's who he thinks he is. He says, I'm a dentist. <laughs> a king. What does a king act like? <laughs> yeah, a king. <laughs> You're not going to listen to a person who's a king and doesn't believe they're a king, doesn't act like a king. A king acts like a king. <laughs> I've noticed a very interesting thing about the presidency of this country. That office is, is an awful, just awesome thing. And I've noticed when a person takes on that office the day before, they're just another schmuck. But you give them a few days in that office and all of a sudden something changes in them. <laughs> they're the president and now they believe it. <laughs> And they start doing things only presidents can do. Did you notice that George Bush's father, every time he's asked something about what George Bush W should do, he says, I'm not the president anymore. And I really believe he means that. It's gone. That awesome power he knows is not his anymore. He can't think like that anymore. <laughs> But W has the power now. And let me tell you, he knows what that power is. The office has taken a hold of him. What he does with it is something else. But the fact is, he knows he's the president. A person acts in accordance with the idea they have about themselves. So what about a believer in Jesus Christ? Does a person really believe that? If they do, they will act in accordance with that idea. I am a believer. Simple. We do what we believe. He lives in me. I am dead to sin.
Well, how does Jesus live in me? You see, we don't want to deal with abstractions here. What does that mean, he lives in me? <laughs> how does that work? Well, I think it's easier answered by going back to the first Adam, because people don't seem to have a trouble with that. Adam! In my history before Jesus, did Adam live in me? What did his life mean to me? <laughs> he nailed me. I had the death life. Adam's death life. I was under the power of sin, and nothing could break that. Adam's death to God was my death to God. Now we can get that. Adam in us. We can see that clearly. Adam in us. That's natural. That's the natural man. The carnal lost man. By nature is the word. So please don't tell me about people being born innocent. Everybody has this problem by being born a human. So now let's look at the second Adam. The first Adam, no problem. We see how that all works. The second Adam. I receive the death life of Christ. See, I said it different that time, didn't I? Same words. In Adam, it's a death life, period. <laughs> In Jesus, it's two different things. His death and his life. That's what I receive by Jesus. In Jesus. Now, we talk about obedience. Well, I think the Bible is clear that God requires obedience. But we seem to mix this all up and we start thinking about every little thing we do instead of looking at the true act of obedience that God is looking for. See, so just before this meeting started, we had a question here about sin. If I sin again as a Christian, what happens? Do I lose Christianity? Well, I want to ask you. You mean to tell me that there's anyone in this room that after they became a Christian, they never did a sin again? <laughs> well, I guess no one's a Christian in this room then. There's got to be something more to the plan of salvation than the fact that I'm a sinner. The plan of salvation is about Jesus. He's a perfect redeemer. That's the plan of salvation. We must see an act of obedience. What is that act of obedience? That act of obedience says, God's word says. Okay? That's my obedience. The word of God says, and in what we're looking at today, I believe myself to be dead. Now, do you, are you obedient or not? Ask yourself the question. Yeah. This is what God is asking you to be obedient about. Do you believe yourself to be dead because that's what he said? Dead to sin. The great fact of Calvary is teaching us this. Jesus died. He chose to die. And that was the power of the resurrection. He died unto sin and was raised unto God only. Well, the fact is there. Now, I need to accept it by faith. And if I do accept it in faith, then the struggle begins. Because one of the first things I learn when I exercise faith 
is that my faith is very weak. It's very feeble. <laughs> and there's just a whole lot of struggle going on then to hang on to all of this. And so faith, real faith, always entails a struggle. Because that little weak faith is trying to break out of that <laughs> and move beyond that. And so everyone here may be thinking, well, if I'm dead to sin, that's what the Word of God says, if I'm dead to sin, why do I commit so much sin? And the Bible answer is very simple. We are not allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to do what God says he will do. That's right. We're putting up a barrier. We're putting something in the way where God will not force us. But he is able to do what he said. And if it's not happening in a Christian, it's because of this weak faith that's not growing yet. And they don't understand, perhaps, that this is what God means for them, that they are dead to sin and the Holy Spirit's being cut off somewhere. Okay? When the Holy Spirit comes from heaven to inhabit a human being, the Holy Spirit of God brings the death and the life of Jesus. Okay? That's what the Holy Spirit brings. Now, it is impossible for the Holy Spirit to bring just one of them. <laughs> the death and the life of Jesus are one thing in Jesus himself. When we receive Jesus, we get his death and his life. We get the death also. They are inseparable. I have fellowship in the death of Jesus when I receive him. Uh, do you understand what I mean by fellowship here? I participate in his death with him because he's bringing himself to me. He brings it to me. What he has experienced, he gives to me. Okay? And as far as heaven is concerned, I have that experience with him. So my fellowship in his death and life do not change the tendency of evil in me at that moment. The root of evil is still in a Christian. Paul explains this carefully in Galatians. He talks about the flesh lusting against the spirit, doesn't he? And the spirit against the flesh. That means in a Christian they're both there. And he says, we have to fight. This, this fight goes on in a Christian. The power of sin is destroyed by what Jesus has done, but that doesn't mean that sin has been taken out of us. Okay, get it clear. that justification is through faith in the merits of Jesus alone. Keep that always there. As far as the Father is concerned, you have never sinned. Because of Jesus. And now he's telling us a Christian, you are dead to sin. Because Christ is in you. You have both the death to sin and his life. All right, I want to, I want to move into this thought more carefully here, so please stay with me here. We all have heard of the word growth. An instantaneous, perfect person who never sins again doesn't need to grow. It's a weird idea when a person believes they are so perfect they're never going to sin again, never going to do anything wrong again, and yet they go around talking about growth. Oh, there's only one kind of a person that grows. 
That's the person who isn't there yet. <laughs> okay? And so growth is part of Christianity because all of us have great imperfections even though God sees us as perfect in Jesus. Okay? We have to stay in real life here. Me. I am imperfect. <laughs> Even though the Father looks at me as being perfect. I am imperfect. And it's very clear to me that I'm imperfect. <laughs> now last time we mentioned the word heart. I hope that in your reading you've been able to notice how many times Ellen White uses the word heart. God is after our heart. Not after our genius, our intellect, our ability to analyze, our ability to memorize, and all those things. Call up pages. He wants our heart, our affections. He wants all of us from that, excuse me, that point of view, the heart. And there's something about our hearts I don't believe we understand yet. God didn't clean up everything about us and reveal us to us all of our sins when we became Christians. Do you think you know everything there is in you you'll ever know that's not right? <laughs> well, then how can you, any of us think, well, I must be perfect now. When we don't even know the bad things about ourselves yet. <laughs> what would happen if the Holy Spirit revealed to us everything that's sinful in us? <laughs> We'd all have to give this up. It's <laughs> like, so forget it. <laughs> Nobody can do this. So God does not reveal everything about ourselves to us. He doesn't do it. He's too merciful. He's too kind. He's not revealing these things. So, when we became Christians, there was not a complete discovery of sin in us. He didn't reveal it to us. That process by itself requires growth. We have to grow in Christ so that we can take it when He shows us something. <laughs> okay? So it's not a reason to get all upset and say, Oh, come on, I didn't know it was that bad. Well, all right, maybe you didn't, but God did. He saved you anyhow in Christ. <laughs> you know, some of us may be very laid back. Some people have that kind of nature. Grew up that way, had nice, quiet parents. Everything went along in a nice, orderly way. Just laid back, never get upset. Nothing bothers this person. And they have no idea that they've got a deep sense of pride. <laughs> and God still has to bring them to a place where he can show them that. <laughs> I'm so proud of my humility. Impatience? Oh, I can take anything. Oh, wait, there's one coming. <laughs> yeah. and there's a big list of the possibilities of who we really are and we don't even know it <laughs> but God's working it so that we will grow and develop and in that maturing process he can show us and we say oh thank you Lord I'd hate to go to heaven with that <laughs> So the Holy Spirit does not reveal to us all these things at once. Now last week we talked about an unreserved surrender. Well, I want to give you a little bit more now. What are the marks of a surrendered person? What are some of the marks? I'll give you some of the obvious ones today. The first one is that a person who has unreserved surrender towards God has a deep humility. They are humble. That humility always leads 
to an obedience that goes all the way to death. Okay? So humility in the Bible is what Jesus demonstrated. Obedient unto death. The humble person looks at the cross and realizes what God is saying and the humble person says, I deserve the cross. I deserve it. What's, what is there to say? What is there to fight? What is there to get upset about? I deserve it. I give myself over to it. Nothing held back. All right, so number one is that deep humility. Number two is a sense of helplessness. Helplessness. You know, when a person's hanging on a cross, they're not thinking about working or struggling, either one. <laughs> they're on the cross. That's that. That's when a person learns to say, I'm nothing. <laughs> I am nothing. And the third thing that we could point out here is that there's a certain restfulness. We talked about that the week before. A certain restfulness. That's a sign. That's a mark of the crucified person. A restfulness. There are many scriptures that talk about what happens in the grave. Okay, And we all get the picture of what happens in the grave. There's not much going on in the grave. <laughs> okay? And I was thinking about it the other day. We all know the phrase, you're not going to take anything into the grave. Not even your clothes, just you. <laughs> we started out that way, that's where we end up. We go back in the grave, I'm nothing. <laughs> well, that's what comes after the death, is the grave. <laughs> I am nothing. And the people in the grave can only do one thing, and that is wait upon God. We spent an entire session on that, waiting upon God. So resurrection is only from one place, and that's the grave. In John 11.40, there's an interesting clue. You know the story of John 11. Lazarus has died and Mary and Martha are all upset. In verse 39, Martha says something to Jesus. She said, you know, he's... It's too bad you didn't get here on time. He's been dead for four days. He stinks now. And notice what Jesus said to her. Said I not unto thee that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Where did she see the glory of God? When Lazarus came out of that grave, <laughs> she saw the glory of God. When are we going to see the glory of God? When we come out of the grave. We're going to see the glory of God. But only believers are going to come out. Interesting little things in these stories. 
They're all teaching us beautiful truths. Well, we want joy and we want victory. We definitely want those things. So I want to tell you something else you want, and maybe you didn't know it yet. We want to die. <laughs> Because it's the only way we're going to get there. <laughs> you want joy. You want victory. Learn to want death the way Jesus wanted it. We want to die unto sin and live unto God. Since we're in that 11th chapter, let's look at verse uh, 16. And notice what Thomas said. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now they were willing, weren't they? They said, we'll go die with him. And, of course, we know what Peter did. <laughs> he said, all the rest of these may leave you, but not me. I'm the Pope. I'm better than them. I will die with you. I will die with you. So Thomas said it. Peter said it. And the others, they were there too. They wanted to say it. They all failed. They said, we will die with you, and they didn't do it. So saying it doesn't count. <laughs> now, I'm going to hit the punchline a little earlier here, because I don't know when people are going to start wandering in. Who did Jesus take with him? None of the men. Only Mary and some of the women believed him at this time. I find no man in the scriptures that believed in Jesus and was praying to him. None except <laughs> a filthy scourge of the earth was hanging up next to him. <laughs> now get this. This man was on a cross. So nobody's going to tell him, you have to get up on your cross. He was on one. <laughs> you want to know the power in that man? Think about that. He was on a cross. <laughs> that malefactor hanging on that cursed tree next to him. His heart was being prepared. I said his heart. He'd listened to the leaders and he was done with that now. He had seen the failures in the church and he's done with that now. He hears the blasphemy of the crowd and he's done with that now. He's done listening to his friends and his relatives. Jesus is hanging right there next to him, and he's paying attention to that alone. And he looks at that, and he says, I know who this is now. For me, myself, nobody else, no time for games, I'm on this cross. <laughs> you know, people talk about the curse of sin. but still don't seem to realize what that means, the curse of sin. People look at their intellect and say, well, I'll use that for good. But I want to ask you, all the wisdom and refinement they can work out, where does it end up? <laughs> They're going to die anyhow. That intellect doesn't mean anything. All their good works mean nothing. The best part of them is useless. Huh. 
When we're talking about the curse of sin, we're talking about everything that we have, not just the bad things we do. We want to look at our sins and say, oh, God can't take me to heaven now. He can't take your good parts. <laughs> Why do we get so hung up over the sins we can see and the sins we don't even know about yet? We get ourselves all in a dither about things we can't give up. Well, there's a reason. If God delivered us from it, we'd think we were good all of a sudden. After we've done our very best, and I'm talking about preachers, I'm talking about doctors, I'm talking about anybody who thinks they can do something. After they've done their very, very best, and they tend to delight in it, and you tell them that must go in the grave. They say, what? My very best must go into the grave too? Yes, your very best. You mean all my affection, all the loving things I've done? Yeah, that too. Not worth a dime. Everything is stamped with sin. Everything in a person who has not died with Christ. Because that's natural. Let's look at Luke 23. Let's see what happened there with that penitent thief. Luke 23, 41. Verse 40. Now we know that there were two there, one on each side. He was counted with the transgressors, and they put him in the middle to show that Jesus was the worst one. Verse 40. The other one answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Verse 41. We indeed justly. Oh. In front of that whole crowd, this thief says, We belong here. <laughs> we belong on the cross. We receive the due reward of our deeds. That was a public confession. I'm nothing. I deserve to be on this cross. The whole man is no good without Jesus. And he believed Jesus was a king. Can you believe that? On the cross, another person on the cross just like him. And he says, that's a king. I mean, try to imagine yourself in that situation and you hear yourself saying that. That's a king. <laughs> a king with a kingdom. And he did the most fantastic thing. The only person that day, the only man, he said to this king, remember me in your kingdom. We're both up here on these crosses. Remember me. You know, that's all it takes. He didn't list 5,000 sins he committed and said, will you forgive me? He didn't do that, did he? He knew Jesus could take care of it, whatever needed to be taken care of. He said, just remember me. Remember me. He believed that Jesus would do that. And that thief hanging on the cross looked over at Jesus and made Jesus' day. All he said was, take me in your arms. Take me in your arms. Now, I want you to notice with me what that thief did while Jesus was on the cross. And I want to ask you, 
Jesus is in heaven today. The majesty of heaven. Are we afraid to do under those circumstances what that thief did when Jesus was on the cross? Jesus is glorified. Can he make it work now? The whole world turned against Jesus. The whole world of men, anyhow. We know about those few amen. But that one man is the only one who prayed to Jesus. And maybe we could say that prayer with him. Let the power of your death come unto me. The power of that death was destruction of sin. We can have perfect fellowship with Jesus because Jesus answered that man. Most fantastic answer anywhere I found in the Bible. <laughs> you will be with me. Two men hanging on crosses. What a conversation. <laughs> you will be with me. We won't worry about the comma. That's not nowhere. Today, Jesus can tell us more than you will be with me. He tells us, I have taken possession of heaven for you. It's done. <laughs> I give you access into the holiest of all. You know, we think back about the 33 years of Jesus walking on this earth. 33 years and only one person entered into the kind of fellowship with him that we're talking about today. And it was that thief on the cross. That thief died to sin. He was on the cross with Jesus in the most literal sense. He was really there. There are lots of things on this earth that tend to tie us to it. And in any number of ways, God is trying to tell us two little words. Let go. Just let go. Whatever it is. And there could be all kinds of different ways that we're tied to this earth. Fear is one of those ways. Yeah. The sense of hopelessness. That's one of the ways. Many Christians go into despair because they think that can never be good enough. Well, they should settle it. They're never going to be good enough. Let go. That's what Jesus says to us. Now, we don't need to understand all of this. There are a lot of things about this that we may never understand, at least until Jesus comes back. How much do you think that thief knew? <laughs> Oh, what could he know? He saw Jesus there. He had known about his experience. He didn't know how this was going to happen. He wasn't even sure when. He didn't know where. But he knew Jesus could take care of all of it. He, all he said is, remember me. <laughs> remember me. The heart that's on the cross can trust everything to Jesus. So I want to invite you, as we close today, to think this little thought through. Something you can say to God and make it work. You can say to God, I have seen your glory. I've seen it. What you did for that penitent one by your side at the cross. I've seen it. I am trusting 
you that you will do it for me. I cast myself into your arms. We can talk like that to God. And God will never fail anyone who comes to Jesus that way. Never. So now we've tasted a little bit more Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and died for me. Okay. Memorize that scripture if you don't have it. Just get it. Say it to yourself every day for a while until it really sinks in. I have died unto sin and I am alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Okay, we'll continue next week. I better close because people are already starting to come in. Let's have prayer. Father, we thank you. Your word is so clear. If we just hear it the way you say it, we thank you. That it's not confusing. We can believe it just because you say it. We don't need to understand everything. We can understand enough to know that you said that the person in Jesus Christ has participated in his death on the cross. And that same person has participated in his victory and his resurrection. But to believe what Jesus has accomplished means that we are alive unto you now. Help us, Lord, to not focus on our missteps, we're going to make them, but help us, Lord, to see that our sorrow doesn't earn us salvation. Our sorrow helps us to develop a character and to learn how to depend on you more. We thank you that you have promised that the latter rain is coming. You're going to perfect that harvest. And we will not know what it is to live without all these earthly taints until that time of trouble after probation is closed and we're already sealed. Help us, Lord, to just keep believing that Jesus is our only hope. And in that may we know we have been received by you, for we are accepted in the Beloved. We thank you in his holy name. Amen.